I'm scared of skeletons, I admit it. The first time I saw one, I was a little kid. This lady from the church was babysitting me and she, for some reason, took me to the high school and we walked into this biology class and she pointed out a skeleton and it really messed me up. I don't know about you, but I'm not big on skeletons. They're like, whoa. Think about a skeleton though. Just a bunch of bones and bones are relics of human existence, aren't they? A bunch of bones. You, you can't tell if my friend here was rich or poor. You can't tell if he was woke. You can't tell if he loved football or not. You can't tell his ethnicity. You really don't even think about his future anymore. He's just from the past. They make all of us a little bit uncomfortable because when I look at a skeleton, I think about my mortality. We all have skeletons. Today, I'm gonna tell you about someone who was rather bizarre. And this is sort of a, a bizarre text in scripture. If this is your first time to come to Fellowship Church, this is a very interesting one because I'm talking about a young man who, who, who was taken from Jerusalem in exile to a place called Babylon. 10,000 of the best and the brightest were moved, were taken captive in essence from Jerusalem to Babylon. One of these guys was named Ezekiel. I'm not talking about this. <laughs> but maybe he, he uh, was the first one that invented that, I don't know, but, but I am talking about the, the prophet Ezekiel. Now when I say prophet, I mean basically a preacher. God's people, the Israelites, they had totally messed up. They were in this spin cycle of sin. You know, they, they would give the love to God, the blessor, and then they would get so immersed in the blessings that they began to worship the blessings over the blesser. And that's a temptation that all of us deal with, isn't it? Something that I deal with, that you deal with. We're so into the blessings and we get so focused on them that we can miss the blessor. And what we're gonna find out today is when we chase the blessings, the blessings have a way of leaving us empty, like a bag of bones. On the other hand, if we chase the blesser, then we truly discover what life is all about. God is a God of life. Isn't it true that, I know you can say this, because I can, sometimes we meet people and it's like they're, they're the walking dead. You know what I'm saying to you? It's almost like they're existing, but not really living. You get behind the veneer and behind the smoke and the mirrors, you're like, man, this dude is just a bag of bones. We, we grow up, hit puberty, maybe in our 20s. You wanna go to college, maybe you don't. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna experience what life is all about. So you go to the bars, you get those buzzes, sleep in different beds, and then you wake up in your late 20s and you're saying to yourself, this is, this is it? I feel kind of dead on the inside. Then you go, well, I'll get married, have a couple of kids and I'll try to make a few bucks. And whatever your goal is financially, you make a few bucks, yet you say to yourself, something's missing. I feel sort of dead. Ezekiel is gonna talk to those of us who feel dead. Ezekiel is gonna teach us that God is the God of the impossible. He's gonna teach us that God is in the business of taking dead things and bringing them back to life. Ezekiel 
In Ezekiel chapter 37, God asks this, this preacher, this prophet, to do something really bizarre. I told you. I love Google Earth, but this is Google Earth 2.0. The Bible says this in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses one through three. You're, you're not gonna believe this. Again, he's talking to the exiles in Babylon. The hand of the Lord was on me, Zeke said. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. We know the Holy Spirit is preexistent and, 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 and co-eternal. He brought me out by the Spirit and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. I mean, that's, that's really spooky. I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. It's like, whoa, wow, wherever you walk, you're, you're stepping on bones, man. He asked me, this is God, God asking Zeke a question. Son of man, can these bones live? And I love his answer. He said, basically, God, you know. I don't know. You know. You know. Sounds like a sports interview, a typical sports interview, you know. You know, yeah, you know, if we play our game, you know, and do, you know, what the coach says, you know, and, you know, we don't make any turnovers, you know, then, you know, we have a good chance, you know, of winning, you know. I know. <laughs> now we like to use the word like, don't we? Like, like, yes, like, like, I don't know, but like, I'm not sure like where like it's going like, but I think like we're going to win like the game, like, 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 like I do. Ezekiel said, God, you know the answer. So check it out. Here's God's preacher. And he's been Google earthed into a valley. Most people think it was the valley of the Dead Sea, 1,300 feet below sea level. Obviously a huge battle had taken place and a lot of people had been taken out. The bones were old, the bones were dry, the bones were dead, the bones were dusty, the bones were everywhere. He couldn't walk without stepping on a bunch of bones. That, my friend, would freak me out. I don't know about you. Bones. So what, God, is your man doing in the boneyard? The first application that I want you to think about, and you have to think with me just for a second, is this story is prophetic, meaning that one day, God's people, the children of Israel, will be brought back to their land. The Messiah, Jesus, will rule and reign. That's one application of today's text. The other one, though, is the practical one. It's like about you and me. It's like about your skeleton and my skeleton, your bones and my bones. Could it be that we have some dead people here? I'm not talking about literally, I'm talking about figuratively. Could it be that your marriage is dead? Could it be that your future, you feel like, is, is dead? Your career is dead? Your friendship's dead. Could it be that you're thinking, you know what, Ed, you just described me, man. I feel like I'm in a valley of dry bones. I feel lifeless. I mean, I'm, I'm breathing, I'm, the heart's beating, but to be honest with you, man, I feel dead. Well, this message is just for you because God, remember, specializes in taking dead things and bringing them to life. I want you to notice several things about this story. Number one, the bones were brutally scattered. It was a brutal, brutal situation. Wherever he walked, there were bones. And God said, Ezekiel, check the bones out because not only are these bones scattered, they're gonna begin to clatter when you preach. It sounded like a giant Lego convention. So he starts preaching. It's in your Bible. 
and all of these bones It was awesome. I've never experienced anything like it. Let me check him out. Let me stop for a second. And let me go into another valley. Let's, let's leave this valley, like 1,300 feet below sea level, Dead Sea, probably where the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were. Let's go outside of that valley just for a second. Google Earth 2.0, okay? Are you, are you with me? Just nod your head. All right, and now let's jump into your valley and mine. Let's look at your skeleton and mine. Let's start. Whoa, let's start with the feet. As God looks at your skeleton, what does he see when he sees your feet? You know, the Bible says a lot about feet. I've got to ask you, which direction are you going? Where are your feet pointing? Are they pointing to the right people? You meet those people right here. <laughs> are you going to the right places? Because you will if you hang out with the right people. And then you'll fulfill the life and the purpose that God has for you. Think about your feet just for a second. Where are you walking? How are you walking? Check this knee bone out. I know what you're thinking, guys. Man, if I hadn't blown my knee out in the seventh grade, I'd be on hard knocks right now. <laughs> I'd be uh, competing for that linebacker spot. Well, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> I used to think I was pretty good, too, until I finally played with some really good players, and I realized... Man, Ed, you're not that good. So, the knee bone, prayer, bowing before the Lord, saying, God, you're sovereign. God, you're the Lord of my life. I'm not. Prayer is simply conversation with God. He wants to meet with you each and every day. And are you kneeling before him regularly? How about the tailbone? Are you sitting on your tail? Are you sitting and soaking? Am I sitting and soaking? Or am I standing, serving, getting outside of myself, sharing the love and the grace and the joy of Jesus? Am I sitting on my wallet? <laughs> I hope not. I have an opportunity to resource the greatest thing out there. This army of believers, the local church. The backbone is another. The backbone is another one, man. That backbone is amazing because the backbone is all about courage. We have a collapse of courage these days. Do you know I read years ago that in Asia, they were experimenting with a bicycle that they could put into a little tiny, like almost a wallet, and they would carry it around, take it out, and a collapsible bike. I think courage, having backbone these days is collapsible, isn't it? Oh, I can't stand really because I might have haters. Well, if you do nothing with your life, that's the only way you're not going to have haters or people saying this or that or whatever about you. Yet the Bible tells you and me that we're to have courage. I don't mean we're to be mean-spirited. I don't mean that we're to be ugly. The Bible never tells us that. It does tell us, though, to stand. To stand. And I'm talking to students now. Students, stand for Jesus. Stand for him. When I was in high school and college, I walked with the Lord. I was not always in the popular crowd because when you stand, it's not gonna happen. I didn't have as many dates, but then look who I married. 
It was lonely many times to stand. It was not easy many times to stand. Looking back though in the rear view mirror of my life, I'm like, thank you, God. And a real wake up call was when I went to my 30th high school reunion. Thank you, God. Let me drop the mic on that one. Anyway, how about the shoulders? How's your shoulder bone? Responsibility. You've heard it said a squillion times. Everybody's talking about being a victim these days. I'm a victim, I'm a victim, it's your fault. It's the system's fault. It's my mom's fault. It's because my skin is this color and the whole thing is rigged against me. It's, it's everybody else's fault. Yet, this book tells us we have to come to a point in our lives, I'm in, in your valley, right, talking to your skeleton in mine, that we have to take responsibility for our lives. I'm sorry, friends, socialism and Marxism is not in the Bible. The Bible is a book about taking responsibility. And sadly, our government and our culture right here is so messed up, we're trying to take more and more responsibility away from everyone, and our government is saying, oh, I know what's best for you. You're an idiot. You're a moron. No, don't take responsibility. You're a victim. And that's why we have critical race theory. That's why we have socialism. That's why we have Marxism. And that has happened throughout history. So let's take some responsibility as men, responsibility as husbands, responsibility as parents, responsibility as students. Look at that big old, big old bucket head. I was with some friends last night and, and, and they were passing around this cool hat. They go, Ed, man, you would look good in a hat like that. I said, no, I wouldn't. Look at the size of my head. My head's the size of a satellite dish. I can't wear a hat. I can't wear a hat. But as I look at your skeleton, as God looks at mine, I look at the jawbone. What are you, say? What are you, what are you saying? What are you doing? How about your language? For real. How about the comments that you make? How about your envy? How about slander? How about that jawbone? What a gift God has given us with this jawbone. It's amazing, isn't it? Do we use it to glorify him? To give him glory? Or ourselves glory? Ha! Ah! Anyway. <laughs> I wonder who this guy really was. Hmm. The Bible says, going back now to Ezekiel's valley, you know, we're kind of going back and forth, back and forth, stay with me. Now we're going back to Ezekiel's valley. Ezekiel's walking around in those bones, man, it's about to freak him out. And suddenly God says, Ezekiel, preach, this is bizarre, to these dry bones. So here we go. Ezekiel, I'm sure is like, Lord, I'm gonna need a message. Lord, feed me, feed me, feed me. He did. Th thank you for that. How about them cowboys? He fed him and he preached to a bunch of dead bones that were brutally scattered. Now somebody slap somebody appropriately and go, 
That is weird. I mean, that's weird, man. Very weird. It symbolized, though, remember, the Israelites, they were dead. They were brittle, non-responsive to the things of God. I have to be honest with you, I've, I've spoken a lot, and, and, and I've spoken to crowds, and when I've walked off the stage before, I've said to myself, it's like the crowd was dead. I felt like I was preaching to a bunch of bones. But then as the scripture keeps going, God says, keep on preaching. God says, prophesy to these bones. And, and as he began to preach to these bones, the Bible says, the Bible says, dry bones, he said, hear the word of the Lord. Then you'll know that I am the Lord. I prophesied as I was commanded. Isn't it crazy that God uses preaching to communicate his word? Let me say that again. The Bible says God uses the foolishness of preaching. I don't save anybody. My sermons don't do jack. It is the word of God. It is the Holy Spirit of God using my vocal cords to talk and to teach you. But God changes lives, it's weird, I know, through preaching. Now, obviously through other ways, but one of his main ways to do that is through preaching. But all of a sudden he was preaching and everything started rattling. As I said earlier, oh my gosh, Ezekiel was saying, what's going on? And all the bones came together. And I'm giving the cliff notes here. Muscle covered the bones. And then all of a sudden, skin covered the bones. And Ezekiel, you know he was dancing and prancing. He was like, wow, look what I did. I must be a great preacher. I took the dead people and now they're walking around. Even though they don't have breath, look what I did. You know he was saying that. You know, I've always wondered that about preachers. You know, preachers get in that weird kind of voice. Can you imagine going out to a restaurant this afternoon and the waitress goes, excuse me, what would you like to eat? Mm, I'd like some enchiladas and some iced tea. Also some chips and guacamole. A little unusual, a little strange. So these bones were, I told you this is a crazy sermon. These bones were scattered. They loudly clattered. But now we're going to find out they really, really mattered. Because God now, click, the bar has been raised. He's gone to a holy nother level. Check out this last part. Ezekiel 37, 9 through 11. Then he said to me, is, is Ezekiel talking? Prophesy to the breath. It was like, <sighs> preach to the breath. And this is what the sovereign Lord said. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain people that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet like an army. That's a good place to clap. Don't hesitate. Participate. The people became people. <sighs> That's the Holy Spirit of God. He <sighs> breathed into their life. Again, that's a prophetic word back in the day and what will happen to the nation of Israel one day prophetically, but also... It's a word to you. Are you dead? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We're dead. Scattered. We're dead. Depressed. We're dead. We're dry. There's, there's no one righteous, no, not one. God, though, can take someone or something 
that you think is dead, that you think is impossible, that you think there's no shot, there's no hope. God can take you, my friend. Connect the dots, connect the bones, put skin, muscle, fiber, and you can receive the breath of God. You can receive life because God doesn't have bad breath. <laughs> Would you pray with me? Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. God, thank you. Thank you for taking us from death to life. Those of us, Lord, who have made this decision from death to life, so awesome, so amazing. God, it's only because of you. If you were here, you might be at our campus in Florida. You could be downtown Fort Worth. You could be in Dallas. You could be at Lasso Ranch. You could be at one of our prison campuses. You could be in Frisco. Just simply say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, I've tried it on my own. I'm just a bag of bones. By your preaching, Lord, by your death, burial, and resurrection, I ask you to breathe into my life and save me and change me. If you did that, my friend, the best thing you'll ever do, let's continue to worship him, the God who brings life.